The American Revolutionary War, a war that would define not just the beginning of a country, but the beginning of a new way of life. A war filled with patriots and legends who sacrifice to ensure freedoms many have today. But some of these legends would be the inspiration behind movies, have cities named after them, and would help America redefine its military forces. This is a story about one of those men. This is a story of Francis Marion, the Swamp Fox. Francis Marion would be born February 26, 1732, in Berkeley County in South Carolina, on his family plantation. His parents would be Gabriel and Charlotte Marion, and would have a total of six children. Francis himself would be born with leg issues and problems, a trait that would be with him his entire life. The exact cause of his leg issues I could not find, but as soon as he could, he would use his legs to adventure outward and see the world. At the age of 15, he joined a schooner ship crew that was sailing to the West Indies, most likely learning hard work and skills along the journey. But on the way back, he would learn hardship and determination. While the schooner was sailing back, a whale had struck the ship, causing a leak to happen. Fast. So fast, the entire crew had to abandon ship and get on a life raft. They were not able to grab any provisions while escaping. It was sinking that fast. The schooner sunk, and the crew, now on a crowded life raft, floated for six days, stranded, having the ocean's tide take them, until they finally reached land. It took six days, and in those six days, two of the crew members would die from thirst and sun exposure. The journey to the West Indies did not seem to deter his sense of adventure. And right around the age of 25, he would join the British military and fight in the French and Indian War. During the French and Indian War, he would mainly fight against the Cherokee, tough warriors to say the least. But when he fought the Cherokee, he learned the Cherokee ways. The Cherokee Indians in the French and Indian War used guerrilla tactics to fight the British. Hard lessons learned, lessons he would not forget, and he himself would use later in life. To describe what he looked like as an adult and pretty much throughout his entire life, he was skinny, sharp-chinned, large forehead, leg problems like I mentioned earlier, not a talkative fellow, and many would describe his eyes as black and piercing. Years would pass, he would take control of his family's plantation. Yes, he owned slaves. I do wish to point that out. Though I don't condone any slavery in any form, it is disgusting and awful, nor should we try to downplay it in the lens of history. But in the context of history, many, many people would have slaves all over the world. Francis, at this time, would be one of them. As the years pass, the government he once served in a military capacity would overstep and overtax the colonies in America. Soon, on April 19, 1775, the Revolutionary War began officially. And a few months later, in June 1775, Francis was commissioned as a captain in the 2nd South Carolina Regiment under the command of William Moultrie. Quickly, the regiment would quickly march. Skirmishes and battles would soon follow. Francis truly believed in the cause of American independence even eventually donning a black leather hat with a silver crescent engraved on it. On the crescent, it stated in bold and obvious letters, Liberty or Death. So needless to say, not only was he a supporter for independence, he was ready to fight for it. Then, in September 1776, he would make the rank of lieutenant colonel and would help in the siege of Savannah. He would fight in dozens of skirmishes and battles for the Continental Army against the British. But for those who don't know a bit about the Revolutionary War, the beginning wasn't the greatest start nor a plethora of American victories. America got the short end of the stick a lot against the British in the beginning. But when life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. One such time was in 1780 during the Siege of Charleston. The British were attacking the city while the Americans were trying to hold out. Francis and his men, along with others, were defending it to the best of their ability. Fortunately, the British forces were too much. The Americans were forced to surrender. 500-ish Americans were taken prisoner that day, but Francis was not one of them. He had hurt his leg or his ankle a few days previously, and therefore wasn't directly on the front line. So when the British overran Charleston, 
he was able to escape. How Francis hurt his ankle is a story itself. How the story goes is that one day he was invited to a dinner party while in Charleston. The dinner party was so bad and so boring that he desperately wanted to leave, only to find that the host had locked all the doors. So he did the next best thing. He jumped out of a window to escape, hurting his ankle to do so. This bad dinner party was a catalyst for things to come. Because of the bad dinner party, he hurt his ankle. Because he hurt his ankle, he wasn't on the front line. Because he wasn't on the front line, he avoided being taken prisoner. Because he avoided being taken prisoner, he became one of the highest ranking officers left. Being one of, if not the highest ranking officers left, he was able to gather the rest of the men who escaped and others around to form a militia. Soon after the siege of Charleston, Francis' militia, now nicknamed Marion's Men, would form and be the only resisting force in South Carolina for a time. This is where Francis' experience in the French and Indian War took over. Hmm, how to fight a larger, well-trained, occupying force? I know, do as the Cherokee did. Guerrilla warfare. Now, for those unfamiliar with warfare at this time, war was basically we line up in a straight line and shoot each other. You know, like gentlemen. And according to the British, anything different was uncivilized. Well, in the eyes of the British, Francis and his militia would fight very uncivilized-like. You see, the men who made up Marion's men, that militia, were not common continental American soldiers. These were patriots who vigorously hated the British. These were men who were volunteers, men who were known to serve without pay, supply their own horses, their own weapons, their and their own food, many times hunting for their own food while fighting the British. Soldiers that define, fuck around and find out. These are the kind of soldiers Francis exactly wanted in his militia. Him and Marion's men would take refuge in the swamps and forests of South Carolina and Georgia. Now, in the same year as the British besieged Charleston, again, wasn't a great year for the Americans, many disasters in battle, but that was traditional battle fighting. Francis and his men weren't fighting traditionally. Being again, for a time, the only fighting force in South Carolina, they decided to ditch traditions and be the best guerrilla fighters they could be. Fuck up the enemy in any way possible. Men after my own heart. That meant hiding near roads to ambush large forces, attacking supply lines to den deny resources to the British, fighting in thick brush and swamps. It meant aiming for officers. Many of you might think, well, this is all common. It makes sense. But for the time, it was extremely controversial and very new in warfare. Francis and his militia forces were fighting the British. Francis and his militia forces, as they were fighting the British, would vary in size from time to time. As volunteers, some would go, some would come, depending on many variables. Historians suspect that at times, Francis fought with as little as 20 men and up to as much as 700 men. But for the most part, the militia averaged around 100 to 200 men. Francis and the militia were extremely good at messing up the supply lines, and Francis himself must have had a deep hatred for the British loyalists because it seems to me those were his favorite people to fight. For those who don't know, at the time of the Revolutionary War, most Americans were on the side of independence. But some still wanted to be part of the British Empire. Hence, British loyalists. These loyalists would fight for and assist the British military during the Revolutionary War. So, a veteran of one war already, donning a liberty or death hat seems a group of British loyalist militia, yeah, 100%, he's going to fight them. With his force in less time than a year, he would be such a thorn in the British side, disrupt so many supply lines, constantly capture troops, and fight so many times that in November 1780, the same year the British took Charleston and this all started, General Charles Cornwallis would be so pissed off at Francis's militia that he would dispatch Lieutenant Colonel Bannister Tarlington and his forces to solely deal with Marion's men. Now, Tarlington is a proper British officer, which means traditional British military tactics. Francis once fought for the British. He knows how they think. Using that and throwing out the playbook of fighting traditionally, Francis's tactics would be so effective that Francis kept up the attacking on British routes and, pay to boot, was also constantly avoiding and escaping Tarlington, mainly through swampland. 
Tarlington would get so pissed off and get no results. After completely failing to capture France's men, Tarlington would say, and I quote, As for this damn old fox, not even the devil himself could catch him. Tall praise from an enemy. And because of that statement made by Tarleton, Francis would be given the nickname the Swamp Fox and be promoted to Brigadier General. This series of events and being chased through the swamp by Tarleton would be the main inspiration behind the movie The Patriot with Mel Gibson. But not all times were good. Being a volunteer force and having to supply basically everything yourself, life was hard. Hunger was common, weather exposure a main concern, and constantly being undersupplied. But the militia endured, and Francis endured with them. He slept on the ground with them, endured the same weather, the same hunger. Everything his men felt and went through, he would go through. Even fighting in the front lines alongside his men. Because he did all this, he was beloved by his men. Even though life was hard and they were at war, he also did not ditch his discipline nor the discipline of his men. Francis throughout the war would not allow his soldiers to plunder from towns or from people, which many gave him respect for. He also used his ruggedness and scrappiness to his advantage. One time, while in the safety of the swamp, a British officer under a white flag came to talk with Francis. Talk about a prisoner exchange. Deciding to play into the swamp fox legend, Francis would serve fire-baked potatoes on a slab of bark with water straight from the swamp with vinegar. They ate and discussed prisoners. The British officer shocked and saying, I quote, This cannot be your usual fare. Francis replied, Indeed, sire, it is. And we are fortunate on this occasion, entertaining company to have more than our usual allowance. The British officer returned back to his company, said that we ate roots, cooked in a fire, and drank nothing but water from the swamp. After making this report, Apparently, that same British officer then resigned from the British Army, refusing to fight the Americans, and returned back to England. Now, how much of the story is true is hard to say, but it would not surprise me if there's more truth than there is fiction in this story. I also want to point out, the psychological mind game is peak, when you can have your enemy over for dinner, and after dinner, they retire and return across the Atlantic because they simply don't want to fight you anymore. Overall, Francis and his militia were great at scouting, intelligence gathering, and overall ambush fighting. They would win many fights and skirmishes during their reign in the swampland. Eventually, Francis and his militia would meet up with General Nathan Green in 1781, and under General Green's command, they would help assist the capture of Fort Watson and Fort Mahdi. The taking of those two forts and dozens of skirmishes and fights would force the British to pull their forces back and had to leave a stronghold in Cayman, South Carolina. More fighting, of course, would now happen, but not as guerrilla soldiers, more as conventional soldiers. Then a major battle would be carried out in September 1781, the Battle of Utah Springs. Being charge of a flank under General Green, Francis's men would help win the battle. That battle would be the last major battle in the Carolinas, and in a major way, help force the British to go to Yorktown eventually. Where, in Yorktown, General Cornwallis of the British Army would surrender. I bet you Cornwallis really hated the Swamp Fox. The war would eventually come to an end officially, September 3rd, 1783. Francis had spent eight years at war. He would finally get to go home. He would return home to his plantation in South Carolina, where his slaves ran away, many to go fight for the British. In history context, a blessing in disguise, the slaves were able to run away. To Francis, it was devastating. He would begin to rebuild his plantation and unfortunately acquire more slaves. Afterwards, he would serve in the South Carolina State Senate and at the age of 54, he would finally marry for the first time. He would marry his cousin, Mary Esther Venu, who is 49. The military life, even years after the war, still called to him. After serving seven or eight terms on the Senate, he would be made commander at Fort Johnson, where he would teach many the ways of the Swamp Fox. Eventually, he would die from what I could find as old age. I'm not sure on the cause of his death, but I believe it was old age. He would die one day after his 63rd birthday, 
on February 27, 1795. On a plaque near his grave, which stands today, reads, Sacred to the memory of General Francis Marion, who departed this life on the 27th February, 1795, in his 63rd year of his age. Deeply regretted by all his fellow citizens. History will record his works, and rising generations embalm his memory as one of the most distinguished patriots and heroes of the American Revolution, which elevated his native country to honor and independence, and secured to her the blessings of liberty and peace. This tribute of veneration and gratitude is erected in the commemoration of the noble and disinterested virtues of the citizen and the gallant exploits of the soldier who lived without fear and died without reproach. Loved by his men, after the war and even after his death, one of them decided to take it upon himself to write and tell the tale of Francis Marion's life. One of Marion's men, a Peter Horry, who, with the help of some of Francis's family, would write the first biography about the Swamp Fox. First published in 1809, and with lots of other data, such as letters and descriptions from both sides, the Americans and the British, it seems Peter wrote a rather honest life story of Francis, rather than a folk tale. And his name still carries on throughout the United States, from sea to shining sea. Currently, there are 36 towns slash cities named after him, 18 counties, 16 townships, 2 naval ships, 4 schools, 3 lakes, and 6 parks named after him. Along with his name, Tied to all those places and things, he is, in America, the father of guerrilla warfare and has such a major impact on the American military that he is credited with lineage to the modern U.S. Army Rangers. He was a complicated man, I will not argue that, fighting in two wars, one with the British, the other against, fought for independence and liberty, and yet was a slave owner fought in a war against superior forces, and used unconventional methods to get it done. Would win fights and lose them. In life in general, he would both fail and win. A complicated man all around, but few in history are not. He is the Swamp Fox, an American revolutionary who was a thorn in the British side for years and helped America become an independent country. And I hope all listening can take lessons from this complicated man and be inspired from his good deeds, and learn from his bad ones. And this was the tale of the Swamp Fox. Thank you all for listening.